as I've been working on my thesis, I've been thinking a lot about the things that have gotten me um, through to this point. And honestly, this is seriously one of the main ones. C1V1 equals C2V2. Um, so initial concentration times initial volume equals final concentration times final volume. Um, you might also see it as M1V1 equals M2V2, which is actually how I learned it. Um, but the uh, where the M stands for molarity, which is a unit of concentration we'll talk about. Um, but the C is more like general when it can be used for like, cause it can be used for like any type of concentration. So concentration is just like how much stuff you have crammed into a certain amount of space. And then like, so it's like stuff per defined space. And then the volume is like how much of that space you have. So if it, you had like this much stuff in this much space, then if you had twice that much space, you'd have twice that much stuff. Um, but the same concentration because you have the same amount of stuff for that thing. And so basically this formula just like allows us to take any concentration and any volume and then like find out like how much we would need to add to make a certain concentration, like a certain volume of a certain concentration. And so you can do it to solve for like concentration initial concentrate you can do it to solve for any of these variables so like c1 v1 c2 v2 um depending on your needs you basically just like rearrange it to isolate the unknown the thing you want to find then you exchange it stick in the unknown so you can replace the placeholders with numbers and then math it out so you solve for that unknown um so things can be kind of intimidating when we look at things with like numbers and subscripts and stuff so let's talk about it in terms of cookies, shall we? Okay, we shall. Uh, um, just a quick note. So you can you might see it also like C I V I equals C um, F B F, where the F is for final instead of like an initial and final instead of one and two. Um, but you can um, do it any I see it either way whatever works for you um and sometimes it's helpful to have the numbers because as we'll see later with like serial deletions your two can, can become your one not it can might not be your actual final final but anyways let's go back to those cookies um so say you want to make chocolate almond cookies and you want the final concentrations to be 50 chocolate chips per cup and 10 almonds per cup and you want to make a cup of dough um so we have for our initial concentrations we're gonna say there's 100 chocolate chips per cup and i just like totally made up these numbers i have no idea how many chocolate chips you would actually fit in a cup but if anyone wants to tell me feel free um so we'll say that we have 100 chocolate chips per cup and then we have 50 almonds per cup um and so we need to find the initial volumes so basically you want to set out like which variables you know so these are the variables we know. So we know the initial concentrations, we know the final concentrations, we know the final volume. We want to find the initial volumes. Um, and so how are we going to do this? Okay, so in this case, we kind of have to, we'll split this up into two equations because we need to solve for the volume, the, cons the volume of the cookies, so V1C, and the volume of the nuts, so V1N. Um, so we start by isolating the variable that we need to find. So in this case, it's the V1C. So we need to divide both sides by the C1C. So we want to find the volume of the cookies. We got to divide both sides by the concentration of the cookies. And we know that concentration. So we know that's 100 chocolate chips per cup. So it's easiest to rearrange the formula when it's still in that like V1, C1, V2, C2 thing um, a lot of times. Um, and then you can stick in the known things um, in turn, instead of the variables, and then you map it out. Um, so we can, um, the units cancel out, so you have chips per cup over chips per cup, um, and you end up with half a cup of chocolate chips. So that's how many chocolate chips you need to add, okay? So we've done half of it. Now let's do the nuts. Okay, so we know that our initial concentration of nuts is 50 cups per nut, and we want to get to 10. Um, and we have that same final volume, um, so, because we have that, we want to make a cup of the cookie dough. So we do the exact same thing, except here we're using the concentration of the nuts and the volume, we're finding the volume of the nuts. And we see that we need 2.2 cups of almonds. Okay? So we have, we have our, we know how much almonds and we know how much chocolate chips, but we need to get to that final volume still. So what we need to do is we need to, quote unquote, dilute it with plain batter. So here our batter is kind of like our water. Um, so we're just going to... Um, see how much batter we need to add to make up that gap to get to one cup. 
Um, so we take, so our final volume, remember that's what we know, that's the one cup. We just found the volumes of cookies and nuts that we need to add. So we can plug those in, um, cause so the total final volume, final, or, uh, um, the, yeah, so the volume of the batter is going to contribute to, the, so basically our final volume is going to be the volume of the cookies plus the volume of the nuts times the volume of the batter. And so now we're trying to find this volume of the batter. So we just need to subtract the other two from the final volume that we want. So one cup minus half a cup minus 0.2 cups, map it out, and we get 0.3 cups of batter. And that is the way that the cookie hopefully doesn't crumble. Um, so we are going to look at a more sciencey example. Um, so because that was fun and like you can certainly use this equation when you're cooking um, and that sort of thing. It's super helpful in all sorts of different situations, but I'm the bumbling biochemist, so I want to tell you about more biochemistry uses. Um, and so one of the main uses is like when you're making a solution. Um, and so here now we're seeing these weird like M things, which stands for molarity, which gets back to why it's sometimes taught as M1B1 equals M2B2. Um, and so what's this M? This M is, um, stands for molarity, um, which means moles per liter. So molarity is just a way to report like a concentration that, so we can think of it kind of like 50 chocolate chips per cup, except now we're in moles per liter. And so basically a mole, it's kind of like a biochemist baker's dozen. Um, it's just like a set thing but it's six times 10 to the 23rd of something. Um, it's Avogadro's number. So it's a ton, a ton, a ton of stuff because when you're dealing with biochemistry, you're dealing with tiny, tiny, tiny little things. And so these tiny little molecules, you're gonna have a ton of them in even like a small volume. Um, so that's why we use this molarity. So it's like, we instead of having to talk about having like six times 10 to the 23rd molecules, we can say we have um, a mole, but in, when we're talking in terms of volume or in terms of concentration, so how much things per set space, so the molarity, so that capital M is going to be moles per liter. So you'll also see, so mole, you'll see, um, also see um, M-O-L is like the abbreviation for M-O-L-E, and that confused me for a really long time when I was learning. I'm like, wait, are they different things? No, they're the same things. It's just like a kind of lame abbreviation because it's like one letter shorter and it confuses people. But anyway, um, I guess it's maybe so that you don't think it's like a skin growth or a little critter. But anyway, so a mole is just like six times 10 to the 23rd or something. So it can be anything. Like you can have a mole of chocolate chips or a mole of almonds. But see, now you have like um, a ton, a ton of, um, you have a really, really small number. So you now you're like 10 to the negative 22 because like the, you have to have so many chocolate chips in order to have a mole of chocolate chips. You have to have six times 10 to the 23rd and there's no way you can stick that into a cup. Um, but anyway, um, so when we talk about molar solutions, um, so a one molar solution would have 10 to six times 10 to the 23rd individual somethings per liter of solution. So like individual sugar molecules or individual salt molecules, um, that sort of thing. With salt is kind of tricky when you talk about like electrolytes because they dissociate. So if you have like sodium chloride, when you dissolve it, it like splits apart into sodium and chloride. So if you have a one molar sodium chloride solution, you're gonna have one mole of sodium and ions and one mole of chloride ions. Um, if you have something that doesn't dissociate, it just dissolves like glucose, um, then you're just gonna have a mole of total particles. Um, so that's gonna come into play when you're dealing with things like colligative properties, which depend on the number of molecules, but that's like way outside the scope of this post. I'm just mentioning that because um, it's something to consider if that's like something you're working with and I have posted on that. But anyway, so in biochemistry, we're often dealing with um, things that are smaller than one molar. So when we have like stock solutions, so like concentrated versions of things that we can use to make more dilute like solutions, 
um, we're often dealing with like things like molar. So we'll have like a five molar um, sodium chloride solution or a three molar um, potassium chloride solution that I use. Um, but when I'm dealing with like final concentrations and stuff, it's often in millimolar. Um, so milli you're probably familiar with from like millimeter. Um, so that's a thousandth of a mole. Or, I mean, the milli means thousandth, so this would be a thousandth of a mole. We're often also dealing with micro, um, which is has this mu symbol, and that's a millionth, and then nano, which is a billionth, and pico, which is a trillionth. And so t we often use these when we're, like, talking about the concentrations of, like, proteins and stuff in solution. Um, and so when you're in biochemistry, you're typically dealing with things that are, like, molar sm or smaller, like, in terms of you're not often going like bigger so like in school and stuff we learned all these like things about like um mega kilo i don't even remember them anymore but giga all of those big stuff um but in biochemistry you're often dealing with this small stuff so it took me a while to like learn these but yeah so you go milli micro nano pico um and um then like down from there um, so, yeah, you can see here some of these common, like, SI prefixes. So, SI is, like, standard international union. So, so basically, you can put all these things in front, um, and then modify them, and then these can be used with molarity, um, what we often see in biochemistry, but you're probably not going to see this stuff, you're going to see this stuff. Um, so those are something to keep an eye out, and if you're interested in biochemistry, you'll probably, um, want to, um, learn those. Anyway, so like when I was talking about stock solution, so basically if you have um, a like stock concentration, so you have like a high concentration thing and then you can use it to make, to dilute it to make a, like a final concentration that's lower so you have more space to add in all the other stuff. Um, so this is kind of similar to how we had a like high concentration of chocolate chips initially and then basically just from like the bag or whatever and then we use that to make a batter that has a lower concentration of chocolate chips but let's go back to making a solution um so say we want to make um a 10 millimolar 250 milliliters of 10 millimolar tris ph8 so it's a buffer so it's like a ph stabilized salt water um or well, in this case it's just the ph stabilizer um this buffer solution this pH buffer, and then this NaCl, so the sodium chloride, we want 100 millimolar. So this is the finer buffer we want to make. So we talk a lot about buffers, so that's like a salt stabilized pH, um, pH stabilized salt water. Um, and so in this case, here's our pH stabilizer, this tris, and here's our salt, the NaCl. Um, so, um, and then we want to make 250 milliliters of it. And so we have these stock solutions. So I have one molar of tris and then five molar of NaCl. And so I have these solutions with these initial concentrations. And now I want to find this final, this um, initial volume because I want to know how much of each of these I need to add. So we're going to see when V1 equals C2 V2 for each component and then add water to the final desired part, the desired volume. So if you want to like pause the video now, if you're trying to work it out, um, I'll give you a second. If not, you can just follow along with me. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're going to move on to the answer. Um, and so this is kind of like our um, problem with the cookies when we're trying to find the nuts and the chocolate chip volumes. But here we're trying to find um, the salt and the, the buffer concentrations. Um, but we do it exactly the same way, except we need to convert the concentration units so they're consistent first. Um, so when I talked about like concentration could be the C is helpful instead of like M1V1 because you can use things that aren't mol in molarity. You can use like any form of concentration, but you need the things to be consistent on both sides and the same with the volume. So we need to convert, um, we're going to convert our millimolar to molar. Um, and so there's a thousand millimolars and one molar, so 10 millimolar is 0.01 um, molar, 100 millimolar is 0.1 molar. Um, so yeah, so you just divide these both by a thousand. Um, so move the decimal point one, two, three, one, two, three. 
Um, and you can also do this with like unit conversion on um, dimensional analysis, which I have a post on. But anyway, so now that you convert these to um, molars, so they're all consistent, and then you math it out. So you want to isolate the tris, um, this initial tris. Um, so you need to divide both sides by one molar, um, and then you get 2.5 mils. And then for this, if you do it with an ACL, you get five mils of that, and then you're going to add water to the, get to your final volume. Um, Another thing, um, so one of the thing to keep in mind is with serial dilutions. So serial dilutions is we use a lot, um, especially when we're trying to do like make a concentration range for something. And basically instead of like adding, it's like if you want to half something and half something and half something and half something, um, instead of like making a solution that's full then a solution that's a half and then a solution that's a quarter like based on just taking making them each individually you take the first solution you dilute it you use that to dilute the next you use that to dilute the next that to dilute the next so in these are these cases you're the c um two so your final volume so your final concentration from this first dilution becomes a c1 for the next dilution so um and then you can keep doing this over and over. And the really cool thing about serial dilutions is that you can then easily figure out the concentration of each dilution um, without having to do this whole series. So you just need to know the initial concentration, the number of dilutions since then, and the dilution factor. So how many much are you diluting by each time? So if you have to, if you half it each time, um, you'd have a dilution factor of two. If you third it, then so like each one has a third the concentration of the product or one, you'd have a dilution factor of three. If it was a quarter, you'd have a um, dilution factor of four, et cetera. And then you're gonna multiply the initial concentration by one over the dilution factor. So it would be like one over two. So a half in this sort of case, um, if we were doing that one to two dilution. And then we're gonna raise that, uh, we're gonna multiply the initial concentration by that raised to the number of dilutions to get to the concentration of that dilution. So if you wanted the concentration of the second dilution, it would be the concentration of the first dilution times one over the dilution factor, so one over two squared, so times a quarter. Um, and so, and that makes sense because in our one over two, this would be a half and this would be a quarter, but we can find it easily by going here. So it might not seem like a big deal for this little, little one, but when you're getting farther out, then it can be um, a real time saver. And these serial um, dilutions are really helpful because they help with like pipetting errors and that sort of thing and they also save time. Seriously though, this equation has like saved so many experiment, set up so many experiment. Like if you look at my lab notes, it's like all over all the notes, just like scribbled like everywhere. Like in my lab notes on paper, towels, on post-it notes, various um, forms of this equation. Um, and so I'd like to thank the equation. Um, and yes.